For 41 years, Joe Riley served as the mayor of the city he so loves. The people of Charleston, South Carolina had the wisdom and the vision to elect Joe Riley 10 times. Yeah. Joe Riley was elected to 10 four-year terms. Through grit and focused determination, Joe Riley rebuilt Charleston into a national and international destination for tourism, arts, culture, and design. But he did not stop at helping to redefine the nature of a city. He took his vision to the rest of the nation. Joe Riley served as president of the United States Conference of Mayors back in 1986 and 87. But perhaps his greatest offering to America was sharing his expertise with over 1,000 other mayors through starting the Mayor's Institute of City Design, which he founded through a partnership between the United States Conference of Mayors, the American Architectural Foundation, and the National Endowment of the Arts. It is no exaggeration to say that Mayor Riley's work has dramatically improved the physical, the cultural, and the social fabric of cities all across the country. From time to time, you'll see a media organization or a website that will attempt to rank mayors. And I'll glance at those stories, but I also think to myself that it's really an impossible task. Mayors come from cities of different size. They have different challenges. They have different systems of government. But I say this without reservation. No mayor in our lifetime has had a greater influence on other mayors than Joe Riley. It is now my distinct honor and privilege to present the United States Conference of Mayors Award for Distinguished Public Service to Mayor Joseph P. Riley, Jr. of Charleston, South Carolina. Can I put it on you? Well, um, Mick, uh, you, my dear, your wonderful colleagues, uh, uh, thank you so very much. Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> like receiving a special honor from your family. And uh, the heart rending uh, feeling of that uh, is extraordinary. I uh, want to thank the staff of the Conference of Mayors. Um, every one of these meetings I've attended, including today, no longer as a mayor, and yesterday, just so thrilling and, uh, and challenging and, and so wonderfully stimulating and invigorating. And, uh, and I think, want to thank the staff for their hard work uh, behind the scenes and um, led by Tom Cochran. Tom was working with the mayors when I joined the conference. He became executive director when I was a president of the Conference of Mayors. And, um, and it's so wonderful how Tom and the staff has kept the conference fresh and, and current and attacking new issues. Tom, would you please stand and be recognized? Well. Well, I, um, I, know, I know what time it is, <laughs> and um, so I'm respectful of that. I want to say uh, a few things um, in receiving this great honor. Um, uh, I remember it so clearly. It was 40 years ago, almost to the day, I attended my first Conference of Mayors meeting. I was so excited and 
dry sponge, just thirsty for information, how to move my city forward. And I got to the first meeting, a morning meeting, early, and I was in Milwaukee, and I remember the bright sunlight coming through the banquet room, ballroom window, and I saw this silhouette that looked familiar, and, and it was Mayor Richard J. Daley of Chicago. And there were just, there were just, it was just Mayor Daley and one other mayor there. I thought I'd be the first one, but they were before me. So I, we, we got our card, our name tag, and to put it on a table where we would sit. And so I, I took mine up and introduced myself to Mayor Daley and the other mayor, and then I put my place card not next to Mayor Daley, I thought that would be presumptuous, but a couple of chairs down. And, um, and then in a minute, he got his card and moved next to me. And, um, and I was uh, 33, I looked like I was about 23. Um, I had a soft voice, uh, my stature is not imposing. And I was mayor of a city that has a, a less, was much smaller and less prominent than Charleston is now. And so this the most famous mayor in America put his card next to, and sit next to me. And I wondered about that for a while. Uh, obviously, he was a very gracious man, as is his, his son and the whole Daly family. But what I realized was that, that, that I didn't have any idea of the, the, the complexity and the responsibility of my job as mayor. I'd been a, a legislator at a very young age. I ran for mayor to, to build racial bridges. African American and white coalition urged me to run and we wanted to attack some issues in the city. But what, what Mayor Daly knew that I would come to learn is that, that we all have an invisible mantle on our shoulders. And that is the, the responsibility for the safety, the well-being, the hope, optimism, and success of every citizen in our city. So size doesn't matter. I was a mayor. They say that the mayor's office is where the buck stops. Well, of course it does. That's kind of a negative thing. That's easy. You get a hard decision, do the best you can, make a decision, move on. Um, but it's so much more than that. We have the responsibility to, to be as creative as possible, to, to with our citizens develop visions, as, as Daniel Burnham said, make no small plans. They do not have the power to stir man's souls. We have the, the opportunity to give our citizens optimism and hope, and for them to feel that we care about each and every one of them. Children know this. I was at a school, uh, uh, elementary school in suburbs. I would get to the schools as often as I can. You can't get there as much as you'd like. And I was speaking to the whole elementary school, kindergarten through the fifth grade. And I like doing that because it's a real intellectual challenge. You know, you got the five-year-olds and the fifth graders. You got to keep eye contact, eye contact with all of them, and so it's really kind of fun. And so I got through that, might have read a book to them, and then they, you know, when I ask questions. So the one child's hand sprang up in the back, I pointed to him, and he said, Mayor Riley, this morning our dog got out of the backyard and didn't come home. And that was his question. You know, now usually, usually the questions are like this: um, How old are you? And um, and then what I would always do, my wife says I'm crazy. I'd say, Well, guess. 
And of course, they, the first one, the hand would spring up like they knew exactly, and they would say, 100 years old. And I said, no. And uh, then, then at, at City Hall, we got this great portrait of George Washington, famous Trumbull portrait. And, uh, and one of the kids one day asked me if I had met him. You know, so anyway. So they're usually different, but that little boy basically wanted to ask me for my help. I was his mayor in getting his dog. Well, about eight, 10 after 8 the next morning, the principal calls me and she said, Jamie, that was the kid's name, Jamie came by the office this morning to tell me that the dog came back and he wanted me to thank you. <laughs> well, well, it's not that we have that power, but it's that we have a bond with our citizens. We understand the responsibility, and they understand our responsibility to be interested and concerned with every facet of their life. And we wipe away the tears, as Buddy did so beautifully, and is Buddy still here? Buddy died, he's gone back, probably had to go back to Orlando. We wipe away the tears in times of immense tragedy like that. And, you know, I, you can't say anything about that except for saying that our national legislators need to get some guts and pass reasonable gun control legislation. <laughs> can't do this again. Um, we make harder decisions than that every day as mayor, for crying out loud. Do the right thing. Uh, don't worry about, the main thing is not getting reelected and, and political office. The main thing is doing the very best you can and what you think is right. Well, anyway, um, but, and when the tragedy struck us a year ago, I knew, as you would know, as Buddy knew, that every single thing I did had to be perfect. Every word I used, every decision I made, that time of unspeakable acts and, and, and heartbreak had to be just right to wipe away the tears and man the hearts. And our citizens know that. I once, there was a woman who was sexually assaulted, it was in the newspaper, you don't identify the people, but we knew who it was, and her, one of her children was a friend of one of our children. I didn't know her well at all, but I, um, but I had a few minutes on a Saturday and, and ran by her hospital room, and um, when I got in there, she said, oh, Mayor Riley, it was so nice of you to come. She said, I knew you would, if you could. And, and, and that's the bond that we develop. Uh, it's not that uh, they're disappointed if we don't or, or whatever. It's that they know that we are their mayor. And if we can, we, would, we will do what we can to help. And then I had this professor uh, writing a book about mayors some many years ago. And uh, so he was there, you know, for, from a, uh, a Northeastern college. And um, so he was asking me questions, you know, and then he uh, said, and now, um, Mayor Riley, how many institutions have you been involved in creating? Well, I mean, I was ready to tell him about the number of jobs I created and the housing units and all of that. And, uh, and I said to myself, institutions, I mean, I don't do institutions, but luckily I kept my mouth shut just for a second. And then I realized, of course that's what we do. That's what Amir does. People come forward with an idea. Who do they bring it to? They bring it to the mayor. You got the bully pulpit. You find the money. You get people on the board. Or it might be your idea. Uh, and whether, whether it is, whether it's a, a homeless, wonderful, holistic center, or whether it's a, a child abuse uh, institution to set up, or whether it's an aquarium, or whether it's colleges, we've created a couple, a law school, or whatever, 
But maybe I finally figured out probably close to three dozen, but, but that's what we do. Representing the city, we're the one person, the one place that has the capacity, the, the power, the, 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 the ability to, to get, bring people together to take an idea and make it a reality. And sometimes we have to do more than just get some people together. Sometimes we've got to help incubate it. And oftentimes institutions get on life support for a while. You're, you stick with them as long as you can. What we know is we never give up. And then once, uh, and I won't keep you here all day, uh, uh, I was at a leadership group, you know, Chamber of Commerce Young Leadership Group, and um, they said, Mayor, describe how you lead. What is your leadership, leadership principles? Well, I don't have any principles, you know, work. And I, so I, I said, well, this is what you do as mayor. You get to know the hearts of your citizens for all the, the variety of things we do with them and for them, all the information we get, the feedback, the emotions. And so we get to know their hearts, which is their capacities. We don't, we don't make decisions on leadership by their blood pressure or their pulse. And we sure as bleep don't make decisions based on polling. That is a paralytic poison for anyone in elective office. They help you get elected. When you get elected, your guts and your ability and your sense of things is what you use. And so I said, we, you get to know the hearts and then you lead them to a place that they might have difficulty wanting to get to right now whether it's a racial progress matter, whether it's a huge economic development matter. Well, like Mayor of Austin with a $730 million bond issue, three o'clock in the morning, things where there's controversy and contention and a lot of people don't like it or unsure about it. And so, but you know that if you get there, when you get there, their hearts will be fulfilled. And it happens. And you get through all of that and all the lawsuits and everything. And, and then people come up to you and they'll say, you know, Joe, I really didn't know about that when you were working on that. But this is the most, this is, this is a wonderful thing. And, and a lot of times they don't express it. But that's the job of a mayor, to fulfill their hearts. And then, of course, is the public realm and the parks. And we own that. We own that responsibility. That's the basis of the Mayor's Institute for City Design. The mayor, if something happens in your city that's wrong, if there's a missed opportunity, if the public realm is scarred, scarred and not healed, it is your fault, it is your responsibility to keep that from happening. And the thing about the public realm, enhanced public realm, and the parks especially, is that when they are stunningly beautiful, the social contract in your community is enhanced. Because we do better as a society when the things that we love the most are not those that we own privately, but those that we share together. That's what great cities around the world have always done. <laughs> so we had this in the parks, and I, I really feel guilty about this. And uh, I don't mind even Mayor Tecklenburg telling people in Charleston this now, because the statute of limitations is run. But I feel, I feel my great, great Mayor John Tecklenburg, who's a wonderful wonderful mayor of Charleston. I'm so proud of everything he's doing. It's thrilling to watch. But, but um, what I feel guilty is that I really should not have taken a salary when I was working on parks. I mean, it just, it was too joyful. I mean, I should have done that for nothing. To be able to, to conceive of and find the land or 
build a, design a park and, and build a park, oh my gosh, what a wonderful opportunity. And they're for everybody and, and they're forever. And we worked hard on this park that was very controversial. It was a waterfront, had to threaten to condemn the property, big controversy, and then you know, lawsuits go to Supreme Court, and then a congressman fought it for you, Di Grant, had to work through that and everything. It took us about 15 years. And you know, you never know for sure whether these things are gonna work. You know, you hope they are. Uh, you don't wanna tell anybody you're not sure, but you think they are. So I didn't, I really worried anybody would use a park. So I go down there one morning when the first little bit of the park has been done, the rest would be finished two years later, but a little pier. And I was jogging at sunup, and I saw this fella sitting on the park, just like the designer said he would. Legs draped over, sunup, and I knew him, he was uh, poor, suffered from epilepsy, adult, lived with his mother, had jobs sweeping up in front of a gas station and shining shoes. And, um, but he was there at the park. So I saw him a couple of weeks later and I said, um, his name was Clarence Hopkins, and I said, Clarence, I saw you down at the park the other day, and he said, yeah, Joe. I said, you go there often? And he said, yeah, I go there every morning. And I said, why? He said, Joe, that place is so beautiful. And I love it when the sun's coming up and so the ship's coming in, you know. When we opened the waterfront park two years later, it was beautiful May, evening. Symphony played, thousands of people there, gorgeous sunset, and I had been looking for Clarence to get him there, found out he'd have a stroke from which he never recovered, but uh, the family brought him in the handicapped van, you know, and all of that, wondered why I was going to all that trouble, but I, I wanted him there because I knew he would enjoy, I didn't introduce him, embarrass him, but, but I wanted him there for me. You know, we'd worked about 15 years on this park, and I wanted them there to remind me and those who worked on it why we do that and why the parks and the public realm is so important, that a person of modest resources with some insubstantial challenges who come to a world-class place and close himself with peace and beauty every day. A wise person said that being alive gives us the opportunity to do two things. Be nice to people. The opportunity to do two things every day. Be nice to people and leave our world a better place. And being alive, we can do that. Just being alive. But if you are lucky enough to be a mayor, oh my goodness, the opportunities you have every day, like Tom Menino said, you know, every day I can go to work at City Hall in Boston and do something to help people. And when I would go to sleep when I was mayor, after a long day, of course, uh, I put my head down and the thoughts I'd have before I went to sleep was of uh, something I'd done that day to help people. Maybe it was the warm smile I'd gotten from an average citizen for something, or an important project that I was working on that I knew would, would, would thrill the citizens. Um, and then I'd go to sleep. And lastly, this is a dream I've had, whether it's a daydream uh, or uh, they merge. But that is, uh, which is a hopeful one, that I live into my December years. And I'm seated at a park bench uh, by myself. And a stranger comes up and sits next to me. And um, without much prompting, he tells me what he did with his life and all of that and, um, and it was very interesting. And then he said, um, uh, and what about you, sir? Kind of like, oh man, did you ever do anything? 
And, um, and then, how do I explain? How, how do I possibly explain what we do? What I did? I mean, the, the, all those millions of images from working with you, dear leaders, uh, and the citizens and all the initiatives, how can you, how can you possibly explain that? Uh, and then I see myself uh, sitting up straight, my old age slouch disappearing, and I look him in the eye and I say, sir, once I was a mayor. That's right. Once I was a mayor. And I thank God every day. Thank you very much. Thank you.